Uh, we have got some really good panelists for this discussion, and I'm not going to take the time to introduce them. I'm just going to go right to work. We'll start with Donna Dean, then Jane Mandillo, and when he returns, Arvind Havra. Donna. Each person has agreed to have one idea that they'll put forth as sort of an anchor for the conversation we'll have and then urge you to ask the toughest, most interesting and provocative questions that you can. If you would like to make a speech, please join me after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Donna? So as we discussed this panel, one of the things we talked about was the importance of emphasizing that each institution has to set an investment policy that makes sense for their own organization and what its objectives are. And rather than following a model that's become popularized or that may seem to have worked for others, uh, and I think my comments for opening will really be uh, about uh, what's unique about investing for a foundation because that's what I've spent the last 20 years of my life doing. Um, and really it is a unique investment challenge. Most of my comments will be based on the fact that I've run a $4 billion portfolio, although as we go along, um, I will try to make some comments about what makes sense for medium or smaller sized institutions um, or take your questions uh, on those. There are three unique characteristics of foundations. The first is that they have very long lives and therefore long investment horizons. In the case of the Rockefeller Foundation, our founder suggested that he thought we could in, uh, exist in perpetuity. And our trustees thus far have wanted to continue to operate in that fashion. Secondly, foundations are required to spend 5% of their corpus per year on charitable giving. And I'll give you some numbers in a minute that'll help you understand why that's harder than you think. Um, this law was put in place in the 70s and the intent at that time was that foundations ought to be able to generate the 5% by investing in fixed income. And obviously that's not possible today, so foundations are being forced today to take a lot more risk in their portfolios. The third thing that's unusual about foundations compared to some other organizations is they don't have any cash flow beyond what they generate from their portfolios. So they, unlike universities, they don't receive tuition or grants um, or con contributions from alums. So it's basically a closed financial loop. And what we have is all we're gonna have forever. And one person said to me at one point that investing for a foundation is sort of like uh, investing for a retired person with relatively expensive spending habits who's going to live forever. <laughs> and that's definitely a challenge. Uh, foundations have two competing goals. Uh, first, they have to provide as much money as possible for the important objective that their program offices are trying to achieve today. Um, and we feel in our office a considerable amount of pressure to do that well but also to preserve the corpus after inflation. So if you, you take the 5.5% requirement, we budget at 5.5% to make sure that in rising markets, we don't fall short of the 5. If you add 2.5% for inflation, plus a little bit for some administrative expenses, you're looking at an 8.5% targeted return. So you have to be very equity oriented in order to achieve that in the long run. I was reading something that came across the wire the other day that was just published by the Council on Foundations in collaboration with Common Fund and they said that for the last 10 years, the average community and private foundation had returned 6.3%, even though where they were aiming for seven to nine. And as I'll say later, I think this is one of the trends that we're going to have to watch in philanthropy in coming years, uh, the inability to, to make the return that we need to make to meet our objectives. So what's really important for a foundation to focus on um, compared to, or in particular, 
um, relative to other investors. And I think the most critical thing is liquidity. I think that we have to spend our liquidity budget extremely careful, carefully and use it where we get the highest premium. We have to be very prudent in putting aside former uh, uh, commitments for the future. Uh, we have to risk rigorously, conduct stress tests, and we have to be prepared for downturns. Um, fortunately, we did some of these things in 2006 and 2007, um, and the foundation even spent less in those years than our three-year average would have allowed us to do. Um, and with hindsight, that prevented us from having to cut back on grants or staffing at that point in time, which and so we weathered the crisis fairly well from a liquidity point of view, even though uh, we had the same kind of uh, negative returns that others uh, in similar, similar equity-oriented uh, positions experienced during that period. So I think I'll stop, and maybe Jane has some things to add. We'll be right after you shortly. <laughs> Jane. Okay. Hello, um, great to be here. I'm Jane Mandillo. We um, thought of this panel in, um, with the idea that there are significant similarities and differences between managing money or among the challenges of managing money for a foundation, an endowment, and a multi-generational family or families. Um, the similarities, some of uh, which um, have already been pointed out by Donna, are that in all of these cases, um, the opportunity and the problem, um, I think the main opportunity and problem is long-term thinking and challenges versus short-term focus um, and, uh, and performance issues. So we get to um, perpetuity in an endowment by thinking about what's gonna happen and from an investment perspective over 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 70 years. Um, similarly, for a foundation that's going to be around into perpetuity, um, the investment decisions, asset allocation, and liquidity needs should be thought of in very long term. And for multi-generational families that might have trusts that are intended to go on for grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren, um, investment decisions, structure, liquidity, and risk should be tailored um, in the portfolio to meet those objectives. But in many, many cases, I, I think may, maybe the biggest problem we could try and address as investment managers for the future is that in many, many cases, the goals of the institution, the foundation, the college or university or the family aren't necessarily well matched with the structure of the portfolio, the risk taking of the portfolio manager and the opportunities that are presented by that long time frame. So that mismatch between um, long-term objectives and short-term focus, short-term thinking, short-term news um, has led to uh, problems um, that can take years and years to work out. If you look at a portfolio that's, for instance, um, positioned very, very um, far out on the risk spectrum and we hit a bump in the road in the markets, um, you can see a very significant difference in loss in a in a portfolio that's very high out on the risk spectrum versus one that's more moderate. If in a market like we're seeing today, um, your portfolio is down 30 or 40 percent versus a portfolio that might be down 10 percent that has more moderate risk, you will be behind in terms of ability to spend and, and ability to invest for five, seven, ten years um, just trying to catch up with what's lost this year and what you're able to gain in future years. Um, Donna touched on spending, um, the flexibility to change the spending level of the portfolio, whether it be an endowment, a foundation, or a family, is a critical piece of this. So um, the amount of risk that the institution or the family will take, can take, is directly related to their spending needs, their spending flexibility, and what their other sources of income might be. If there are no other sources of income, and there's very little flexibility in their spending, this is all the money they have and they spend a lot of it, clearly they're gonna be much less likely to, to ride out a storm and be happy at the end of it than in the case like the Rockefeller Foundation where spending was um, kept at a, at a very moderate level and could even be reduced below the, um, 
the long-term three-year spending after the crisis. Uh, we sort of had the opposite side of that at Harvard when I was uh, managing that portfolio during and after the financial crisis. The flexibility on the side of the university budget was quite limited, and universities have very little short-term discretion in their budgets. They have a lot of medium and long-term fixed costs. Um, so their ability to adjust their spending when the value of the endowment decreased suddenly and significantly um, was not great. Spending went to well over six, seven percent um, and stayed there for several years. And that had a big impact on the types of investments and liquidity that we had available to make investments in the years following the financial crisis, making the recovery from the financial crisis longer and harder than it would have been. Um, if spending had been more flexible going in. Um, so some of the differences, but I, I think the crux that I'd really like to get to and, and welcome your questions is this issue of we all get short-term news, we all get short-term reporting, we all get um, short-term focus and get the objectives that we should follow as investors and that our clients will best, be best served by are actually very long-term. Ashwin. Um, so I'm Ashwin Chabra, and firstly I want to say I'm delighted to be back. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I got my PhD here a couple of decades ago in theoretical physics, and uh, and uh, left a permanent recollection behind it. <laughs> yes, and, and I had a very different experience then. Uh, in fact, this building wasn't even there. Um, so uh, you know, there, there were several interesting things that are worth focusing on, and and one thing that um, I do think that we should all think about is there's something very wrong with the way we invest. And I, I look at this in terms of, so I've, I've spent some time when I was at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton um, as the CIO looking at endowment investing um, and then more recently as Chief Investment Officer of Merrill Lynch and the retail and institutional fees. And so when you look at this across the entire spectrum, um, the reason people invest is not to make money, right? Making money is a proxy for doing something else. It's like when you don't know what you're going to spend that money, then you need the money. It's like a reserve. You're really investing because you have a specific goal in mind. And whether you're an individual or an institution or an endowment, that goal, the series of goals, the importance of those goals, the flexibility around those goals, the minimum amount you need to achieve those goals, and what would put the institution or the individual or the family at risk are probably the most important things that you can focus on. Um, and in many ways, that's the low-hanging fruit, and we all miss it. Instead, when you look at CIOs or even individuals having conversations with their financial advisors, um, investment committees having conversations with their CIOs. It's all about investment performance, right? And searching for the right manager. And that's the hardest part. In fact, that's the part that you really can't control very well. Uh, only very few people can do it well. Yale does it exceptionally well, and so kudos to them. Um, but you know, the average person cannot imitate the Yale model that easily. Um, and so, you know, we heard, we heard a, a, a very interesting talk earlier today. I think Andy Lowe um, talked about the cancer fund, right? And that's the idea for institutions and endowments. Like, what is your purpose? Maybe your purpose is to make very big bets to chase a disease, um, very much like, I believe, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation did. And, you know, it paid off big, and they sold, they had a multi-billion dollar payout with Royalty Pharma. But it could have also not paid out. They could have gone out of existence, and that would have been OK, because their job is to solve a disease. So you make big bets. That's very different from Yale's um, objectives, which is you know, continued world dominance, <laughs> <laughs> especially in the field of education and research. It seems only um, fair. Which, which seems to be working very well. And so you know, more power to David Swenson and, and, and everybody associated with that. But the idea that, that in the end, at the end of the year, you look at all the endowment and foundations um, returns and, and you go you know, in the Kubo or wherever you're looking at it, and they all have a 0.6 beta 
they all have certain percentage of you know, 20% to 30% in private equity and 5 or 5% to 7% in VC. It's just ridiculous. It's a, it's a failure of us being able to understand what that money is, how we should invest, what theor theory tells us, what parts of the theory are good, what parts of the theory uh, are bad, and how do we tailor uh, the investment strategy. So I'd really like to focus on that, and that's the theme of human capital. How do we take the human capital that we have um, in all of these different areas? So I'm gonna take advantage of the privilege of being mic'd up and sitting nearby you. And Donna, I'm gonna ask you one, and then go down the, when you look at the Rockefeller Foundation, and just in fair disclosure, my first job out of school was working for the Rockefeller family, so I learned something about how difficult it was for Mr. Rockefeller to set up the foundation because the governing agencies didn't trust him. And he really had to work very hard. To, he wanted to get a federal because he thought America was great and he wanted to do something for the nation. And they said, the hell with it. We won't let you have a federal. As you look at the Rockefeller Foundation, over time, it's probably as good an exemplar as we've got of a long-lived institution that ought to be perpetual. There are enormous number of foundations that are qualified under the IRS, many of which are really vehicles for individuals who have made medium-sized and larger fortunes to have the privilege of being able to decide what they want to do when they want to do it. There is a view that the 5% limit or requirement was a compromise that wasn't all that heavy a burden. And that some would argue, look, most foundations are roughly 50% funded by the individual, 50% funded by the American taxpayers who didn't get the benefit of that money being taxed. So they had to put up more money. So it's public in some way. Where in size do you think it's probable that you should say that should be a spend down endowment with a time limit or an annual percentage that's higher than 5%? And at what qualification would make it appropriate for an institution, a new one, to be like Rockefeller, like Ford, like several others, establishes a perpetual foundation? I actually don't think size is the criteria. Um, because there are some very large foundations who may be doing types of work that they can complete in a relatively short period of time, a generation or two. Um, there were others like Rockefeller who over a period of over 100 years have demonstrated that they not only can solve systemic problems, but can teach others a process for solving those problems and pass that knowledge along from generation to generation. So I, it, I wish it was as easy as a numerical cutoff. I think it's a qualitative judgment that to some extent needs to be left in the hands of the trustees of each of those individual organizations. But um, if the government is gonna take a stand on it in terms of taxation, would have to be a set of criteria determined about whether or not the work that that institution is doing is something that could go on for generations and contribute to the well-being of the world. Does public governance matter? Many of the family foundations are really controlled by three or four members of the family or the only trustees. It Whereas should, you I have think. wide open. It should, I think, yeah. yeah. Okay, Jane, when you look at universities, uh, the short-termism that sometimes is shaking fists about the investment community. Many universities' faculties are also pretty intense about this is my one time in life. I'm only 39 now. I won't be 39 forever. This is my most creative period. I need the financing to be able to do the great things that I could do. Do you see a balance where there's both sides are struggling with their own imperative to do things now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's always um, been a topic of discussion in my 22 years at Harvard and five years at Wellesley and two years at Yale way back when. How much, what's the appropriate level of spending from the endowment and of course the faculty will want it to be higher and the, um, the guardians of the endowment will want it to be more moderate. And I don't think that that's because the guardians of the endowment are greedy or, or egotistical or 
Um, you know, they're, they're, they have some other alternative goal. Um, I think that it's very natural that there are pressures from the academic side to spend now, solve this problem, but also um, I understand after having worked for decades in this field that there are very few people, even in the environment of a top-notch university, who understand the true financing of higher education, how difficult it is, and the different parts that go into it. So we are looking at a picture in terms of the financing of an institution like Yale or Harvard that includes the endowment. The endowment used to be a 10 to 15 percent contribution to the operating budget. Now it's a 35 to 40 percent contribution to the operating budget. That means if you had no endowment, if you spent down the endowment, you would have to cut your budget by 30 or 40 percent institution. Um, dramatically changing what you might be able to do in future generations. And then uh, tuition being another component of the financial picture, but tuition being uh, more and more at, at the elite institution at least subsidized so that the full ticket price is not paid by the majority of the students by um, a quite significant margin. Um, and then federal dollars to higher education, which have been shrinking for some time. So the financial picture is complicated. Um, there are pressures on every piece of it, and um, keeping the spending level at a 5% or lower, I would argue, um, level for the health of the institution over generations to come is very, very important. But we have that debate all the time, all the time, with, uh, with faculty, sometimes with alumni and donors, sometimes um, with other parts of the administration of the university. And um, I think it's a healthy debate. Uh, I think it's absolutely natural and it will never go away, but I feel very firmly and strongly that the endowment should be managed for perpetuity, not for today's pressures, because today's pressures are always going to be there. And in fact, we've seen over the course of my career, the pressures have gotten much, much greater. So in, in terms of how to finance these institutions um, that lead the world in higher education. Can I ask Please. Uh, let me just to give you a couple of numbers that I think would illustrate how Rockefeller has used this ability to exist in perpetuity. Um, and um, let's start in 1929 when the foundation was fully funded. We had a series of gifts over years, but in 1929, the family had given us $250 million. If you just present value that based on inflation to today, it's a little over $4 billion, and that's what we have. Over the life of the foundation, we've also given away $18 billion in today's dollars to ch for charitable purposes. So if you can strike this balance between giving away a lot today and preserving the corpus, and you do have the ability to exist in perpetuity and to do work that's meaningful in that time horizon, it's a very powerful concept. The two arguments against it. One would be Warren Buffett's. Look, they're going to be rich people in the future. They'll take care of the future. We don't need to provide for the future now. And the second argument is the work of the foundation or the university is so spectacularly valuable that the incremental value of further spending at the university or grant making is higher than you can get in the markets as a rate of return on the investment. So you actually optimize the value set that was behind the concept by spending the money now. And if you do a really great job, it'll be all the easier to raise giant amounts of money in the future. But that suggests that today we know what all the problems of the world in the future are going to be. Our do you know any group of trustees who aren't confident of that? <laughs> well, our trustees had a, a, ba a big debate in the 50s about whether or not to use all of the corpus uh, to fund the Green Revolution in Asia, and they decided not to do it. Uh, and given the, some of the work that we're doing today, I think that was probably a wise decision to use some of it, but to hold on to some of it for what seem to be perpetual problems of trying to address uh, poverty around the world. Yeah. Jane, do you want to pick up on that? Well, I, again, I would just return to, you know, that the, if the sticker price for a student paying full tuition is $50,000, the actual cost of that education is more like $150,000 a year. 
Now you could argue, and I'd be happy to take part in the argument, I don't know the answer, that that model that costs $150,000 a year per student needs some skinnying down. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know how to fix that. There's probably things that can be done, but you're charging 50. It costs 150. And most, the most expensive parts of it are in science and engineering. Um, and, that's the, and that's where many of the institutions are spending a lot more um, proportionally of their budgets. Um, so, you know, if we, if we say these big endowments are not necessary, or let's cap the endowment, or let's spend more of it because it's way too big, um, what we're going to do is we're going to have to either take that $150,000 number and cut it significantly, or that $50,000 ticket price is going to have to go up and, and cause even more um, uh, unfairness in who pays and what they pay and who's able to come. Well, you also have an alternative. You could, as we've done in many other parts of America, recalculate the allocation of the costs and bring it down that way. So no, no change in the problem, just change in the visibility of the problem. Mm -hmm. Ashwin, you make this wonderful proposition that every investment program should be as long-term as possible and nailed to or tied inextricably to the real purpose and mission of the organization. Wonderful thing to say, something I believe very, very deeply. But in my own experience, it's been exceedingly difficult to clarify exactly what that means. Do you have any guidelines for those who would say, you know, I, I think Ashton was really right about this. I'd like to pursue it. One choice would be to read your book, which. <laughs> well, which, thank you for saying that. Yeah, so I don't have to say that. <laughs> those of you who have any curiosity weekend, about investing terrific. whatsoever, every 10 years we do a good book in the world of investing. And this 10 years is yours. And, thank you. <laughs> uh, David Swenson had his 10 years. And, Bert Malkula had his 10 years. It, it's a marvelous reality. It's a beautifully written book, easy to read, relatively short, and it's got ideas expressed and clarified that you've never really had clar clarified nearly so well elsewhere. So it, it's not a bad investment of a Sunday afternoon. But without everybody having read it, you're here today. We've got the opportunity to ask you the question. What is the way someone who says, you're right, we should be much more specific? How do we get there? So uh, first I should just say, I don't think I can live down that description, so thank you. Um, and also, you know, your own work was very influential in, in writing that book. Um, so I'll go back to the phrase of sort of winning the loser's game, right? I mean, I, I believe that what we see right now is an arms race between you know, different universities, regardless of their size, they've picked their peer group, and they need more money. Um, and you say, how much more money? How much money is, is the right amount? And the answer is infinite, right? You ask yourself, um, even for individuals, how much do you need for a safety net? Well, the answer is infinite, because theoretically, in the absence of constraints, in the absence of clear goals, um, somebody gets a disease, you need a million dollars to, to fund personalized medicine. Um, you know, the country goes to war, you need to leave. So unless we embrace the idea of safety nets and, you know, safety nets for individuals, for society, what the cost of education is. So that's a very important piece. And you say safety nets are very expensive. What's the return on a safety net? The answer is zero, right? So that's the fundamental first principle is how much do you need for safety? How much does an institution need for safety? You have to define what safety means. Is it a minimum standard you want to continue? Is it for perpetuity or you know, do you really have to be that long term or maybe you want to be short term and you want to have well-defined goals that are short term that you need to get done? I mean, funding your kid's education is a very good example of a short term goal actually because there's a very finite time limit and you better have the money by then. Um, so there's a safety net and then there is sort of just investing in the market where you get the market return. And you say, well, what is the market return? And the answer is, I have no idea. There's some historical numbers, some wonderful work you know, done by um, uh, you know, uh, several people at uh, uh, the Yale faculty, Goetzman and others, as well as Dimson. And you, know, you can do some historical stuff and say, well. It should well, be clear that most of the original work was done at Yale at the Coles Foundation. That is correct. Yes, <laughs> yes at the Coles Foundation. Yes, and, 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 you know, and, and you sort of do a la Markowitz, who also 
that the work here, and you say, um, you know, I can get the market return, and you know, if, if I can get less or more, but so will everybody else. And by the way, today it's very easy to get that market return. It's very inexpensive. You can get it simply by indexing. You want to do something more interesting with active management, go ahead, do it. It's not going to make much of a difference, right? Unless you do it really well, which is what Yale has done. Get a substantial alpha and compound over a long term. Then it does make a big difference. So then the question is, how do people really get wealthy? And the answer is, you need a third strategy now. How do institutions get to the next level? It's not through market return. It's not through manager selection. It's not through asset allocation. It's not through the safety net. Of course, you need the safety net, otherwise you don't survive. So there is what the third bucket, what I call the aspirational bucket, and it requires a very different way of investing. It's these concentrated bets where you have alpha. And you, it, you need human alpha, you need investment alpha, you need to be able to concentrate, you need leverage, which is usually non-recourse leverage, and you need to be outside. So you need to do everything that modern portfolio theory tells you not to do, in some sense, in a diversified portfolio. And so the essence of the book really is that if you want to invest well, you have to start with your goals. You need to identify them carefully, figure out in terms of cash flows, risks, scenario analysis. Think of a large deviation world where everything could go wrong or great or wonderful things could happen. So, so it's really not mean variance, it's not normal. It, it's, it's sort of black swans and everything else you want. And then you really need three portfolios. And this is the idea of they have to be constructed differently, they have different outcomes, they have different certainties, and this is what I call risk allocation. And I think this connection with goals and then risk allocation is more fundamental than asset allocation. I think asset allocation is almost a lower level construct, um, and it's the opposite of what you see in investment policies today, which start with asset allocation, a la Brinson, and, and, and sort of return attribution, and then go to manager selection, and then go to um, this dissection of returns that goes on, uh, which really creates an incredible short-term horizon. So I was, I was just thinking as Ashwin was talking about this, um, about my first few weeks um, at Harvard Management um, in July 2008 when I started in, in the teeth of the financial crisis. But one of the first things I did was I talked with each of the deans of the schools. So the dean of HBS, the dean of the law school, the dean of the college, on down the line. And um, I set up appointments with each of them and went in and said, I'm, I'm the new head of the endowment. What's, what are your goals? What are your plans for this school? And um, can we talk a little bit about what you're thinking? And I would say every one of them said, um, sure, but why are we having this conversation? Why are you here? <laughs> and um, so that was so illustrative to me and has stuck in my head as to the mismatch or maybe lack of communication between the goals of the institution or the client or the individual and the portfolio manager and how they think about the portfolio. No one from Harvard Management had done this before, had gone and seen all of these deans. These deans didn't know why I was there. I don't even think they knew where Harvard Management was. Um, and that was astounding to me because they're the, the livelihood and the excellence of the place that they were managing depended on what we did and how we did it and how we were positioned and what kind of risk we were taking. Um, and the idea that that conversation just doesn't even take place um, is a, a, an amazing thing. So I think it's a very important point that you make. And it resulted, I think, in 08 in a mismatch between liquidity for um, you know, different parts of the university around the CFO office, um, the bond covenants that could be broken um, with the endowment, uh, where traditionally they had been sort of dealt with separately. Donna, I'm going to ask you a question that I would love to know what your answer is. If you don't like the question and you'd like to say something else, I'm game to let you go right ahead. <laughs> you have a fabulous long-term record of doing really first-rate job in endowment management. It's, um, as the saying goes, world class. You must have observed others trying to do a good job, hoping to do a good job, but making mistakes. And if you were advising someone who was going to be a new trustee of a major foundation, one of the perpetual foundations, and they wanted to know 
with all of your experience, what should I be watching out for on the positive side, watching out for on the negative side? What coaching would you give them? On the positive side, I think I would encourage them to work closely with the CIO on developing a team and a culture in the investment team. Um, that's something that I've worked hard at and I'm proud of. Um, three of us, including myself, on our team have been working together for 20 years. Wow. And in addition to our track <laughs> record, I'm pretty proud of that. And, but, you know, we've had young energetic talent coming in at the same time, which one needs. But that the respect among that group of players and the expertise that they've developed and brought to bear on this portfolio and the degree to which they buy in to the foundation's mission and are behind achieving it, I think is very rare. And if an, a, tr a new trustee could encourage the CIO to spend enough time on that, um, that could be an important contribution. I think sometimes CIO, it's easy as a CIO to get caught up in the next manager or the next trade or, um, and, and some technical aspects of doing the job well or predicting where the market's gonna go. Um, and you have to realize that you can't do it all yourself. Team building and delegating and um, growing people is part of the job as well. Um, I think the downside has to do with whether or not people understand the risk in their portfolio. And that's a really hard thing to do in endowment portfolios. It's pretty easy if you're uh, an investment bank and all of your portfolio can be put into a uh, computer and run through modeling exercises that give you risk numbers, VAR, et cetera. But when half or more of your portfolio doesn't have transparency and you have to use a disparate set of facts um, to, to get a look at where the risk is in your portfolio, that's, that's really challenging. And I think that trying to at least have that conversation is something important for investment committees to do with the staff to make sure that they're not just following another model and getting going down the path toward taking too much risk without realizing it. I know it's contrary to your normal cultural style, but would you like to pick up on any negatives? Negative. Well, you're always very nice to everybody under every circumstance, so <laughs> <laughs> we don't think of you as being someone who would, but you might want to identify one or two negatives that mistakes that people can make. Taking too much risk. I think I was trying to couch that as one of the biggest mistakes. It's easy to get caught up in a particular, uh, with a particular manager who's interesting, something different, something new, something exciting that the team hasn't done before. Uh, and sometimes that has to be caught by the governance structure. Neat. Jane, you've worked with Yale mm -hmm. and Harvard and Wellesley, and many people think, well, endowments are endowments and endowments. I suspect you do not. Mm -hmm. um, what is the driving characteristic that would cause endowments of your own experience to really differ in what they should be doing or the way in which they should be guided by either investment committee members or trustees or members of the investing organization itself? Well, those are some good questions. I want to answer um, the question you asked Donna, though. Okay. <laughs> but I'll answer right. that. I'll answer that. Oh, that's you. fair. Okay, I, I, think, <laughs> no, I think that um, as a trustee of um, a, an endowment or a foundation, there are two things that um, I would advise anyone to do. One is challenge the basic assumptions. And still being supportive of, of the staff, you don't want to cut them off at the knees, but challenge the basic assumptions because the staff can get kind of caught up in their own thinking and it's wonderful to have people who are going to, without being destructive about it, come in and um, stir things up a little bit say, well, why do you think? Why do you think there's a premium for private equity versus public equity? What shows you that? What, what makes you think it's going to continue? I think that's, that, that is um, a, a key role of a, of a trustee. Another one is to help cut through the noise or just say, ignore the noise. C CIO, investment staff, ignore the noise. 
Um, there's so much noise in our lives today and between the 24 hour, 24 seven news cycle, the minutia that gets um, picked up and covered by the press. I was listening to the radio on the way down here, satellite radio, and they had an advertisement on that said, um, uh, but they're going to have a Pope station for the Pope's visit to the US. They're, gonna, they're going to have a Pope's station, 24 seven coverage of the Pope's visit to the US. And I thought, this is really getting out, out there. I have a lot of respect for the Pope. I'm glad he's coming to the US, but do we need 24 seven coverage of that? And that probably doesn't have a direct relation to an investment portfolio, but it's just an example of how there's just so much minutia and so much noise. And I think the trustee can really help by saying, you know, forget that. Everything under this layer is, is, is not something you should be spending time on. You should be spending time on this layer up and um, you know, having someone to, to, to give you that advice when you need it is very helpful. So do you want me to go back to the other question? I'd be glad to if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> what differentiates um, endowments from, from one place to another? We, we've already talked a little bit about the, um, the real difficulty of finding outstanding investment managers and strategies and how um, those are not, th those skills of finding those managers and those strategies are not something that every office has or can come by. And um, it really makes a difference if you, um, if an endowment has um, a staff that's experienced, knowledgeable, inquisitive, can travel, can um, investigate new ideas, bring in thought leaders. Um, that's, that's one thing. There are many others who are um, smaller, don't have the dollars to put to that. And, and the whole model has evolved around that, which is the third party um, endowment management model, outsource CIO, um, to help those smaller organizations with some of those challenges that they couldn't possibly afford to pursue on their own. So I think there's an advantage for some of the larger institutions that can um, really staff and, and push um, the, on those ever increasing um, challenges of, of finding the cutting edge investment management idea. And then um, the smaller uh, or uh, less financially adept institutions that should probably rely on others and, and um, often end up being more followers. But if they're gonna follow in an intelligent way, they often are using a, a third party organization. Yeah. Ashwin, the same question exactly, but shaped any way that you really want. You've had a wonderful opportunity to observe different organizations, You've been deeply involved in a couple yourself. Um. Um, well, I mean, I, I think the, 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 the best characteristic any board or um, investment committee and um, the investment organization can have is humility. Um, because we really have no idea what return, future returns are gonna be in what shape. And, um, and so a lot of the short term, the short termism I think that we've been referring to comes from a natural evolution of firstly predicting, realizing your prediction is wrong, scrambling to sort of adjust. And we know that certainly in retail investors, um, that's a persistent source of underperformance. I believe that is true for institutional also. One of the things you see is that retail investors and institutional investors are not that different. The time scales are a little different. So uh, individuals will change their portfolio more rapidly because they're looking at it every day or every week. And so after a year, they, they're tired of the manager that's underperforming and they're done. Because every time the manager underperforms, think of it as being slapped in your face. You know, how many times are you gonna get slapped before you, you react? While in institutional process, you do it every quarter. So every quarter is much more um, um, you know, tempered a little. So after three years, people get really upset and say, okay, three years of underperformance, I'm done. You could scale the whole thing. It's the same behavioral pieces coming through. So all of this effort of finding new managers in new countries, Africa, India, I think is, is overdone. And I'll give you a very simple example. I mean, I grew up in India, so I sort of understand the Indian culture, um, I think, better than somebody who, who did not grow up in India. And, you know, people would come and say, well, India needs water, India needs infrastructure, we have money, um, and somehow those two things are gonna connect and give you an excess return. Terrible, terrible analysis of the situation. <laughs> Completely wrong. I mean, the one thing, don't even think of India as a poor country. It, 
it, it's a vast country where there are a lot of people who are incredibly rich and probably richer than several, you know, there's a whole percentage of population because the distribution of wealth is different, which, is, which are richer than, the, than a great percentage of, of the US. If there was money to be made, they'd be putting their money there in infrastructure and making it. They don't need some outside money coming in, right? But that system has been heavily optimized. Every square foot has been optimized. Every rupee has been optimized over thousands of years. It's just not optimized for the person who's not getting the benefit. It's optimized for the person who is getting the benefit. And so the idea that somebody can come in because you, you now have a check to write fly into India, meet with 15 managers, make a decision and exit, um, you know, you're quite frankly the sucker on the table. Um, and this is what people saw in terms of infrastructure. You could come in, but you couldn't exit with a good return. So um, I do think that human capital, respecting different cultures, different investment strategies, different ways of making money, and creating an entire process, and then saying, maybe for our institution, we don't do Asia, right? You don't have to own the world. You know, that's false diversification. That's in the Warren Buffett way, as he says, you know, the absence of any knowledge. And, and if you need, you know, you can diversify. But if you, if you have alpha because you're an institution and you have some alumni or you have a school of engineering or you have biotech, then concentrate on that because you may be taking less risk than just by diversifying. One of the big risks that many institutions are making right now, if I borrow on what you were saying, Donna, is they've got an assumption what kind of rate of return they can get. And they've got an assumption that's built up sort of stack by stack, not unlike the way you did. This is how much we're going to spend. We need to adjust for inflation. We've got some cost structures that we need to cover. And so that adds up to whatever. Are you in, in any way deeply concerned? I am deeply concerned about Expectations, looking back, it was pretty darn wonderful. Looking forward, it might not be anywhere near that wonderful. And one of the largest risks I'm afraid many institutions are making is to believe, because they know they deserve to have a higher rate of return, to believe that they will somehow get a high enough rate of return and keep cranking along, probably creating a larger and larger accumulated difficulty. Do you want to comment one way or another on that? Well, I think if you look at today's environment and where we are um, in fixed income markets and equity market valuations, there's a lot of uh, truth to the belief that we're not going to be able to get the returns going forward that we have. And I think all of us who run particularly philanthropic institutions have to be prepared for that. Um, I think we had um, a difficult period in 2008. Um, and we sort of figured out how to get through that, but the markets recovered so quickly. And I don't think that might not happen again the next time. Right. You know, what I'm really worried about is a 20 plus percent correction and then low returns for a long time. Because that's a hole that's very difficult for a foundation to crawl out of when you have to continue to spend at 5%. That's such a clear statement. Does anybody want to add anything or offer a difference? Yeah, I, I mean, f firstly, I'd say historically returns have been very good, but mainly in the US. So I, I know that Bill, for example, Goldsman has done some very nice work about crisis in other countries. You want to look at, you're talking about in perpetuity, so let's look at the last 100 years. Um, and you know in the last 100 years, um, most of the markets either went out of existence or um, you know, through the First World War, the Second World War, and so on and so forth. Um, secondly, the 08 crisis is not over by a long stretch. So, um, you know, you're in some far from equilibrium situation. And um, if, you could, if you could, like, you know, somehow get rid of one of the world's worst financial disasters by just printing money, you know, we'd be doing it all the time. Um, it's not going to happen. There's going to be a pretty bad whiplash at some point and we just don't know what it is, what form it'll take. Um, so in fact, now I have, at least in my book, I have a chapter which is a slightly radical way of computing, saying don't accrue and discount at different rates. I don't know why we do that, because it just makes all these projections rosy. You know, if you need a certain amount of money, assume a diversified portfolio will give you purchasing parity in the future. 
then if you get something more, that's a bonus. If you get something less, you can squeeze. But the idea that let's accrue at 8%, just because we kind of have been doing that for the last 30 years, is absurd. There's no theoretical basis for it. There's no foundation for it. We don't really know how stable this stuff is, and we certainly don't know how stable it is for different countries. I mean, maybe for the US being a dominant superpower, yes, but not globally. So. Uh, that, that's a great point. Uh, yeah, the expected return, if you take any portfolio of uh, diversified portfolio today and say, take, it, take any range of expected returns for equities and bonds, John, I mentioned this earlier, you know, it, at one point the bond portfolio could cover your spending rate. Of course that doesn't happen now, the bond portfolio is a zero and the equity markets, whatever your projections are, they're probably lower for the next 10 years than they were over the last 20. And um, you have fixed, in, you have, um, private equity and other alternatives that have been played um, by much more, many more players and probably have less inherent alpha in them. So I would say every CIO you talk to would say my expected return for my portfolio is lower today than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But how many institutions are lowering the number that they're putting into their spending rate calculation or lowering their discount rate on their pension assets? And if they lower it by 25 basis points, that's a big deal, whereas the expected return on the portfolio is probably down 150 or 200. And um, what is happening on some of the, in some of the um, investment committee discussions I've been involved in various um, institutions is that um, it comes down to a compromise. Well, let's include 100 basis points of alpha because we've been getting that. So, you know, the expected return on this mix of assets is only four, but we've get, gotten 100 basis points of alpha, so let's put that in and make it five, and therefore we're still, you know, not spending more than we're projecting. Um, you know, we're, we're, making, we're making up a fiction of why this is going to work in the future the way that it worked in the past, and I don't um, think that that behooves our institutions, and, and it's, hard, it's hard, it's hard to bite the bullet and say, Markets are different. Portfolios are probably not going to get there. We should start painting that into the picture. Those of you who are inclined to say, well, Jane must be alarming. <coughs> uh, Greenwich Associates does an annual study of institutional investors, and it is astonishing whether it's labor union pension funds, corporate pension funds, endowments, the expectation uniformly across every group is that their managers will outperform the market mm -hmm. by, <laughs> by 100 basis points. Mm -hmm. That's a fairly large delta. Mm -hmm. And, and um, everybody's gonna get it. I'm gonna close our meeting by <laughs> referencing to one of Yale's really distinguished trustees years ago, maybe 50 years ago, William McChesney Martin was chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank. And he was a devoted Yale alumnus and he had an acute sense of humor. And I wish I had enough time to tell you the funniest part of his story, so I'm not gonna be able to do that, but those of you who catch me afterward, just say, what's the story about Richard Nixon? And I'll be glad to tell you. <laughs> he said, defined his job as taking the punch bowl away just as the party's really getting going. <laughs> and I would like to try that and then ask you for your opinion. Everybody forms a view over a 50-year career that they finally learned something, and I think I finally learned something, which is that the number of people of great talent, marvelous personality, first-rate character, and a willingness to work very hard with a competitive instinct that drives them to do the very best they possibly can, have swarmed into the investment management world. And we now have, and I'm, I'll show you how to do the calculation, Mike Bloomberg has put out 240,000 Bloomberg machines. I don't see why anybody would have a Bloomberg if they didn't have at least three or four or five people who could use it. So round it off to four. Four times a quarter of a million. You got a million people who are out there trying to figure out perfections in pricing, finding and discovering any error, taking advantage. And the talent of being applied to that has gone up and up and up. At the top end, it's simply astonishing, and they are enjoying a wonderful success. But I mean at the tip top, tip top end. Don't have to come down very far before you find that you're getting sort of normal returns. And when you get below that, you start to get subnormal returns because the costs of playing are enough to take something away. At what level 
should someone say, I am not going to index because I can do better by enough to make it worth my absorbing the risks that are inherent in active management as active managers strive to beat the index. How high up do you have to be to believe that you should be working with active managers to do better than the index funds? <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, well, you have a great point. I don't know about the number, but um, there definitely are, should be more people using, more people and institutions using index funds for at least part of their portfolios. Um, you know, what we see is that uh, you have dozens of managers, a few of them do well, some of them kind of match the market and some of them do poorly and you end up in, in if you're lucky, um, sort of market matching performance but deduct fees, you're not beating the market. Um, so there are many, and in um, individual cases um, in particular, I think that individuals um, feel that they need to chase that, that great return that they heard about their neighbor getting or their boss getting, or, and um, they just refuse to believe that an index fund is good enough. And it's actually much, much better than most of the other alternatives. So um, in the advisory work that I'm doing right now with the um, high net worth family, one of the things we're doing is cutting out about half of the managers and putting the money into index funds because they, they haven't beaten the market. They're spending a huge amount in fees, and um, they certainly could do much better, much simpler, um, and much more efficient. Let me make what I think yep. is the strongest argument for indexing. It's fine to do a little bit better because you've made fewer mistakes, which I think is mm -hmm. basically the reason for indexing in most cases. But the great one is the one that each one of you has focused on is, but yes, but what's the real purpose? What are you really trying to do here? And if you had nothing to distract you, from that really important question, you might actually be answering it. And institution after institution is a little bit soft or shy or in, not up to it in terms of the way in which they are answering with rigor for us as an institution. What should we really be trying to accomplish? What are we re how can we make a really strong connection with our endowment? So if I can amplify just a bit, because that's a very important point. Uh, in, my, in my book, I, I sort of talk about um, active management versus passive management is one of the grand debates of finance um, and actually being a false choice. Um, that it's actually a boring question, it's an irrelevant question and it really speaks to what you just said, which is it's a distraction. So if you want to do indexing, go do indexing. You want to do active management, go do active management. Try not to screw up too much, so don't get too uh, excited about it. If you do it well, you'll probably make some alpha, which is positive. If you do it badly, you'll make some alpha, which is negative. Now, it won't make any difference to you in the end. Because if you're getting the index plus minus a percent or two, and you're gonna spend plus minus a percent or two based on if you're feeling flush or if you're not as an institution, you're pretty much averaging out. So why do we invest? What's the purpose of the institution? It's, and for individuals, you just want two things. You want safety and you want impact. And the market is in some sense a way to store value till you figure out how much you need for safety and when you need it, and when, how can you make impact and how do you do that? And I think the point that I'd like to make is those things, safety and impact, require different portfolio construction, different ways of structuring. You don't get safety from a market portfolio, you don't get impact from a market portfolio, so you have to therefore have this balance, and in the middle, your market portfolio, since you're just storing value, you know, go index, go do active management, have some fun if you must, but that's not the central question. We are past our time, so I'm gonna just, on behalf of the audience, say thank you. You guys are just wonderful. Couldn't have asked for a better. <laughs>